The Texas Parks and Wildlife television series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. The idea of this predator deterrent fence is to deflect predators away from the nest area so that hopefully they won't find the nest and destroy it. The introduction of a predator species into a huge ecosystem, it, it touches a lot of different things. We're trying to collect as much information as we can to ensure that the resource is available today, tomorrow, and 100 years from now. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This is the Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge. And folks have shown up at the annual Atwater's Prairie Chicken Festival for a rare glimpse at one of the most endangered birds in North America. And I got him in the scope now. Oh, he's got his, his tufts erect. He's, he's going into his dance. Oh, fantastic. Over a century ago, the coastal prairies of Texas and Louisiana were home to almost a million Atwater's prairie chickens. But as habitat turned to farmland and Houston and other cities grew, the coastal prairie shrank. Now less than 1% of pristine coastal prairie is left, and this refuge is one of the Atwater's last strongholds. It's been teetering right on the, the brink of extinction. Over the last uh, 15, 20 years, there have been fewer than, than 100 individuals in wild, wild populations. And for a species that only lives on average of two years, that's a very bad place to be. You know, there are endangered species all over the rest of the country and the world, but this one here lives only in Texas, and it's part of the natural heritage of, of Texans. We just found a nest. It's the fourth uh, nest that we found this season. She's extremely well hidden. She's in very, uh, very dense cover, and uh, that, that's a good thing. That means uh, hopefully predators won't see her either. With some rebar and some metal fencing, the team is here to set up what they call a predator deterrent fence to protect that nesting female. The predators are, are moving through the grassland. The idea of this predator deterrent fence is to deflect predators away from the nest area so that hopefully they won't find the nest and destroy it. Got it. The fence doubles the chances of survival for the mother and her brood of chicks. You do kind of keep in mind that, you know, the whole time you're working, there's a bird in there that's, you know, struggling for survival, basically. So you want to build a fence that's going to hopefully work and give them a little bit better chance at surviving. There's word that one of the female's nests... So where was that exactly? ...has been destroyed. Oh, okay. Oh, man, we got... We got eggshells and the nest bowl's been disturbed, so it's been predated. Oh yeah, the yeah. eggshells everywhere. Yeah, something's really, really dug it up. Oh. She put up a good fight yeah, though. Yeah, she's little feathers everywhere. Poor thing. To help the moms and these newly hatched chicks that are just two weeks old. Go ahead and clean the pans. 
The hen and chicks stay in a protective brood box, an enclosed refuge with an all-you-can-eat buffet of veggies and bugs. And there are grasshoppers, katydids, beetles, but mainly grasshoppers. Um, those make really good chick food. Once the chicks have, have hatched, uh, conditions have been so dry that uh, the young chicks are having difficulty finding uh, insects to eat. Just call out the numbers so we make sure we get all 14. This breeding season so far, we're starting to notice that it seems to be getting a little bit drier. It's been very windy this spring. So we're a little bit concerned about how the chicks are going to fare. It should be all of them. The young chicks get a final weigh-in as their release into the wild is now just days away. 26.9. We like to weigh them just to make sure that they are indeed getting enough food and metabolizing it correctly and Last putting one. on weight. One more. Okay, it's time for them to, to take off on their own now. They've had their two weeks of head starting and they're looking pretty good. Yep. It's fun to see every couple days they change and you know, they get noticeably bigger, their feathers get more um, obvious and colorful, they've gained weight, they're looking healthy. Hopefully they'll have what it takes to survive. We feel good. We got them here to, to this, this point, um, but at the same time we're a, we're a little anxious as well. I hope they can do it. They're really going to have to be on their uh, best of their game if they're going to make it to the point where they'll have a chance to reproduce as well. While these birds are struggling in the wild, the team has an ace up their sleeve. Head looks good, mouth looks good, so she's good to go. Several facilities raise endangered Athwater's prairie chickens as part of a captive breeding program. She looks in good shape, feather condition is good. Adding birds from the captive breeding program has allowed us to keep birds in the wild through the last uh, 10, 15 years. Okay, she's ready to go. Without the captive breeding program, uh, this species undoubtedly would have been extinct by now. These juvenile prairie chickens are color banded, radio collared, pretty bird, and ready for the refuge. It's a long journey to their new home, as these captive birds are for now the lifeblood for this entire species. Okay, okay. She's in good shape. Ready to roll, aren't you? Working with an endangered species, it, especially the arguably the most endangered bird in North America, you know, it has its ups and downs. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, a little bit disappointing. Things don't go quite as well as you want, but it's also rewarding when things do. So I think everyone would agree it's worth it. Doesn't she look good? Mm-hmm, she does. How many other species can we watch go extinct before it starts making a, a difference in, in the ability of the world to support us as a human species? And, and we don't know that answer. After two weeks of acclimating to their new habitat, it's time for these young birds to venture out. All right, little birds, go be wild. All this work, the struggles throughout the breeding season, it's up to these young atwaters to help save the species. Oh, yeah, see, freedom. While not all of the birds that we release are going to survive, we know that, but those that do survive uh, represent the future. Their offspring hopefully will be better able to survive and reproduce in the wild on their own. You know, we will continue to build the population with those wild individuals and, and that's where we place the hope for the recovery of, of, of the species.
One night, uh, I had a dream about this one giant fat lionfish coming up out of the Gulf of Mexico, scraping one side on Louisiana, the other on the Yucatan, and just coming up onto the land. That was just one giant nightmare. We knew they were coming. When you looked at their placement on a map, they were on either side of us. We were caught in a pincer movement. It was inevitable that they were coming to Texas. We're very concerned as a scientific community about the lionfish because there's a lot at stake. Um, recreational fishing, commercial fishing is huge in the state of Texas in our offshore waters. In their native Indo-Pacific, they have natural predators. Here, um, the predators really haven't learned how to deal with these animals yet. The ecosystem is in a very delicate balance. So when you throw in a species like lionfish, we really don't know what will happen, but we're pretty sure it's not gonna be good. So Texas Parks and Wildlife organized this symposium to bring together experts and really just see what we know and how could we come together collectively to figure out how to solve this problem. We had seven different areas, such as outreach, funding, legislation, control, all these different areas. And now we're going through the process of figuring out um, a hierarchy, good ideas, bad ideas. And then we're going to do which ones are practical? How much do they cost? And that's what the Second Line Fish Symposium is going to be about. We had several community events, for example, down at the aquarium. And there were panel discussions and presentations to make the general public aware of the problem and what they faced. At the Texas State Aquarium, we have the opportunity to educate others. Uh, we have a lionfish exhibit that puts that particular invasive species in people's face. They're able to become aware, and it gives us an opportunity to educate them. We should realize that the introduction of a predator species into a huge ecosystem, well, it, it touches a lot of different things, um, and a lot more than people might might expect. It's not going to find Nemo or find Dory. In fact, the lionfish is probably going to eat Nemo and Dory, and that'll be the end of that story. Some of the guys that I work with, they, they said it's pretty tasty, and, uh, and they want more. <laughs> Having Texas Parks and Wildlife step up, organize this symposium so that we can be ready uh, shows great leadership, and I'm very, I'm very pleased to see that. Until the future looks a little bit brighter in terms of dealing with the lionfish along the Texas coast because of the symposium, and then because of the efforts of the group, all the collaborative group working together. I'm really proud of Texas Parks and Wildlife. The team we assembled is great, and all it took was asking. Everybody who was already too busy made time for this because we all recognized how important it was. I don't know where their time came from, but I know that there was a lot of heavy lifting and you can't ask for a better bunch of people. Folks are in awe of the rock, just that something this massive and this large is, is out in the middle of the hill country. I think that's why it became Enchanted Rock. They thought that it was something different, that it wasn't something that should just be out here. It doesn't matter how many times you come to the park, it's never the same thing, and that's what I really enjoy about the rock. The Native Americans were inspired by it. They felt that it was inhabited by spirits. Mystical, magical, enchanted. It's not like your normal park. Enchanted Rock is an outcropping. It is the inside of a volcano that didn't erupt. They say that it's the heart of Texas. I think it's enchanting because you can rock climb, you can fish, you can hike, you can camp. And to me, that's what's enchanting about the area. The Hill Country is a beautiful place. Enchanted Rock is located 17 miles north of Fredericksburg and about 25 miles south of Llano. People can still come in and still get that one-on-one -on -one feeling with nature. There's a good amount of wildlife and plant life within the park for folks to study. The middle of the week is the best time to come out to visit Enchanted Rock and, and virtually have the place all to yourself. You'll see a little bit of everything, over 60 species of birds, various reptiles, mammals. The first time out, obviously you want to make it to the summit.
take in the view. It's 425 feet, so you can see forever. It's beautiful, but I think the view is beautiful no matter where you are in the park. It is a magical place. They estimate it's one billion years old. It's gonna be here long, long after we're gone, and, and of course that's a good thing. We want generations of tomorrow to be able to enjoy it for years and years. They look prehistoric. They're awesome looking fish. Lots of teeth. They're something that would be dreamt up as a monster in a Hollywood movie, but the truth is they're just not such monsters. They get a bad rap a lot. Have a good life. It's late spring on the Trinity River between Dallas and Houston. That's basically it. Fishing guide Dawson Hefner is on the hunt for alligator gar. We're looking to get something over six foot here today. But catching a gargantuan gar first requires catching some smaller fish. That's a haul. That's the easy part. Are you keeping these? Yeah. With bait on board, the gar anglers head down river to try their luck. Y'all ready? As far as uh, rod and reel angling for alligator gar, most people give you a strange look when you tell them that's what you do. Uh, they just look at you dumbfounded like, uh, really? Along with Dawson on this gar quest is his friend Jason. I've always felt like a, a game fish is what people tell you you should catch, but a sport fish is what you want to catch. So I definitely consider a sport fish. Jason once landed a gar here that was bigger than him. My personal best is six feet, seven inches. I like catching all different species, and the bigger, the better. Jason's friend John is also an experienced angler, but he has never fished for alligator gar. They get to such huge size in, in the freshwater environment of Texas. I think most people don't realize how large they get, and really what an exciting adventure would be to, to catch one. In Texas waters, the long nose, short nose, and spotted gar can all be found. But the alligator gar grows the largest of all, with catches weighing as much as 300 pounds. Eight feet is not uncommon. Hopefully a hungry fish will come through here and find it. Though trophy-sized gar can be caught around the state, the Trinity River is known as one of the best alligator gar fisheries in the world. Though you might not guess that today. We're having a pretty slow day here so far. We've been set up on this spot for about an hour and a half, haven't had any runs. It's looking like we may need to move and see if we can find some more active fish somewhere else. People don't travel the Trinity River. I don't think it's publicized or promoted at all, but there's a lot of natural beauty here, tranquility, and uh, just the absence of people. I'm a people person, but uh, not when it comes to fishing. <laughs> the fewer people, the, the, the more plentiful the fish, I think. The crew finds another promising sandbar on a bend in the river and serves up a variety of cut bait. Rod alarms will signal a bite, so there's only one thing to do. There is a lot of waiting involved. But they haven't waited for long when there's some action on the furthest rod. Something is taking this one. Some days there's actually enough activity that you don't get to relax because you get to run back and forth the rods most of the day. He let go. That'll keep us going for several more hours for sure. We're getting closer. <laughs> As catching gar has become the focus of more anglers, Studying them has become a focus of fisheries biologists. Historically, no one really cared about them, no one really right. fished for them, yep. so the managers didn't really spend time collecting data on them either. That meant little was known about the lives of alligator gar, but biologists Dan Dougherty and Chris Bodine are changing that through studies like this one on Choke Canyon Reservoir. Anglers have gotten much more interested in, in fishing for alligator gar, hook and line, as well as bow fishermen. The increase in popularity obviously is putting greater pressure on our populations. We've got a fish on already. Hopefully it's a gar. Texas is home to the best populations of alligator gar left in the United States. And we want to keep them that way. 
The only way to do that is to collect data one gar at a time. We get fish in the boat and uh, uh, you always want to be a little bit careful around the head because it is full of teeth. But the cool thing about it is that they're overall a pretty docile creature. They just simply want to get back into the water. So we tag the fish with two different tag types. An internal tag called a pit tag. And we also tag them with an external tag. If an angler catches that fish, he can call the number that's on the tag and report that catch to us. 451. And that's very important information for an idea of harvest rates. 1439. Length and maximum girth. We also take a genetic sample. 585. Once a fish is released, rinse and repeat. Oh, they are full of slime. Nets are reset, scanned for fish. Big splash. And retrieved. It's Buffalo Central today. Freshwater drum. Unfortunately, they catch right. anything big that swims by. Not quite the right kind, but we are catching fish. By the end of the day, Dan and Chris have caught only four alligator gar. Definitely don't want that dude in our gill net. But they do feel lucky to have not caught an alligator or the other toothy creature they spy on the lake as they pull in their nets. What is that? Is that a rattlesnake? Dude, it is a rattlesnake. Look at him stick his head up like that. I've never seen one. Rattlesnakes in the water. Now I can say I've seen it all. That's gotta be an alligator gar. The next day of research has a slow start. Negative. Only one gar by mid-afternoon. But after hours of looking, they find the fish. They're surfacing like crazy, so. Oh, that was a big splash. This is gonna be exciting. Moments after being set, two nets are full of gar. Little guy. Easy, easy. Watch your legs. Soon, the boat is jumping. Okay. Lord, mercy. It's kind of like the angler coming out to fish. Some days the crappie bite, some days they don't. They must work fast for all the fish to survive. It's amazing. It's amazing. Done? Yes, sir. Come on, buddy. Play nice. 14 fish in five minutes. That's gar fishing at its finest there. It's a big contribution to the research. Bye, baby. And it's a sure sign that catching big gar has a lot to do with being in the right place at the right time. Back on the Trinity River, timing has not been right for John, Jason, and Dawson. Dad gummit. In spite of getting some bites and fishing all night, they have not landed a gar. By morning, they have other problems. We've got thunderstorms on the way in, and it's already started to rain, so unfortunately, we won't be able to fish any more today. But determination has them back on the water in three weeks. The weather is clear, and this time, Dawson has some added support. My wife's along today for good luck. See if that won't help straighten things out. It seems to help. Within minutes of the first cast, there's a fish on the line. Real, 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 real. Strength, this massive strength. It's a challenge, and I, I enjoy a challenge. Ah, he's a fighter. Woo! -hoo! It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Adrenaline rush you get, it's totally worth it. Oh, this is great. Not a bad fish to start the day. My first one, <laughs> outstanding. All right. I can just get back up the bank for you. <laughs> He's a good four, four and a half feet long, would be my guess. I certainly want a photo of that one. Be good, fish. <laughs> we haven't seen a giant gator guard today, but uh, you know, they're still fun to catch. All right, away he goes. While this fish story comes to an end, Hang on to the story of alligator gar angling may be just beginning. It does seem like they become more popular each year. A face only a mother could love. <laughs> With anglers and biologists taking care to protect these fish, gargantuan gar should always have a home in Texas waters. Had a great time. People travel from all over the world to fish for these fish, and uh, there's not a lot of other experiences like it.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.